Welcome to Toxicology, brought to you by Recovery Unplugged, the place where we talk about all things substance abuse, recovery, and mental health, with guests offering varying perspectives and viewpoints. Hosts Joseph Gorordo and Jason Cabello share about their addiction and recovery and other serious subject matter through lighthearted yet candid conversation. Did you know (laughs) that apparently regionally, like people can tell what region you're from based on if you do like rock, paper, scissors or paper, scissors, rock. I've never heard paper, scissors, rock. Never See, heard of I that. grew up going paper, scissors, rock. Really? Yeah. And then I and then I changed. I assimilated. Did you? <laughs> in Mexico, are we talking about? In Laredo. In Laredo. Okay. I've never seen that. All right. Anyway. Rock, one, paper, <laughs> <laughs> paper one, scissors, rock, go. Okay, okay. Paper, scissors, rock. I was going to go with this anyway, oh. so you win. Okay, cool. All right. Um, I'll intro. I'll intro. Do I'll it, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, hey everybody, and welcome to another wonderful episode of Toxicology, the world's latest and greatest podcast focused on addiction, recovery, and mental health. Um, as we like to say, sometimes lighthearted conversations about difficult subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is my co-host with the most, uh, Jason Cabello. Pleasure to be here with you. Looking fantastic today, so oh, stop. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing really. It's. A, yeah? I feel really good today. I'm, in I'm good, feeling real good. Today I'm in a good too. place. Isn't that great? Yeah. Shit. Usually one of us is a little bit mopey. Yeah. Usually you're a little mopey. <laughs> Usually I'm a little, mopey. Yeah. I'm a little more negative. No, it's you. good though. Um, I've been diving back into my step work. Yes. I have three sponsees that I'm working with now. Um, this guy who I was sponsoring for a while. Um, he was going to find somebody locally. He lives in New Jersey, Mm -hmm. but he hit me up this week and was like, I'd like to just, you know, I I haven't found anybody. So, you know, I need to tell on myself on my disease. And, you know, he, he's halfway through law school Oh, and, uh, I was his tech at at RU and we met and just started talking about music and stuff and started sponsoring him. And I got three guys who I'm working with now who are doing it. And it, um, motivated me to start getting back into my step work. I took a little bit of a hiatus from actually doing any step work. Yeah. So I felt like I was uh, kind of talking the talk. But not walking. But not walking the walk for a while. Yeah. And I'm doing it again and I feel good. Love it. Yeah. Love it, man. Are you doing anything else different that you think is maybe contributing to you feeling real good? Or is it just that spir- spiritual it's maintenance? It's that, just doing it. Ju- just the fact that I'm giving myself the time to work on myself. Yeah. Um, paying attention to just some of my my behaviors and the things that I want to change about yeah. myself. And I told you I've been doing um, doing some work on my work, living with my ADHD without using any sort of medication or anything. And that seems to be, it's difficult, but just the fact that I'm doing it, it whenever... The things that usually get me stuck and frustrated, knowing that I'm like taking the steps to do something about it makes it a little bit easier to deal yeah. with. So I love that journey it. for you. And you know what? So in the spirit of that, I'm doing a gratitude list daily. Dude, you know, well, the let, me, benef- let, me, let me finish here. Mm-hmm. And I would like to do a gratitude list for some of the people who are behind the scenes for toxicology that we never really get to talk about. Okay. So Michael Gray, who does our, our web... Uh, Michael Gray. We have our website being launched too. Yeah. Toxico- a, yeah. website? Toxicology. Thank you. Toxicologypod.com. We need to get I, him some Disney paraphernalia. I believe, yeah. As a thank you. Gabby Cohen. Whew, Gabby Cohen. Does our social media. Yes. Behind the scenes, Greg. She does, also shames me for being an Apple Music person and not a Spotify person. She's right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Teach his own man. Um, yeah, so Gabby Cohen doing mm-hmm. our social behind the scenes. Greg for just always being there. Behind the scenes, Greg just picked up six years. Okay. <laughs> he's okay with talking about that. Okay, yeah. I just didn't know if he was. So Some okay. other stuff, he's not. Okay, I think. Well, congratulations, behind the scenes, Greg and Sadie, too. Um, They actually just took part in a commercial that I did for Recovery Unplugged. I will, let's insert clip here. Insert clip here. The the commercial for Recovery Unplugged Virtual Services. It's a great commercial. Starring behind the scenes, Greg. Yeah, y'all did a great job. It's a great commercial. I told you it had a National Lampoon's vibe, and you were like, that's what we were going. Yeah, yeah. So insert clip here. There's no place like home for the holidays. The tranquility, the togetherness, and the love of family. 
If you are battling addiction or mental health struggles, but can't get away for the holidays, Recovery Unplugged offers virtual treatment from your home, office, or even your family table. Take our doctors and therapists home with you this holiday season. With Recovery Unplugged virtual services, peace of mind is possible. Why leave home for the holidays when you could call or click Recovery Unplugged to start your virtual treatment today? What'd you think? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. So that's good. But also also some other people at Recovery Unplugged, uh, Kay Anderson, who kind of spearheaded this whole thing. Yeah. And Andrew Sasson, who is our CEO and uh, head honcho. I'd like to yeah. thank- Andrew's a visionary. All those guys. And, and yeah. to the people who have, um, you know, m- my girlfriend, Gabby Delgado, who was, did what the behind the scenes Greg and Gabby Cohen currently do. So- started this podcast. I think while we're doing this, we might as well show some gratitude to my wife who hated every Thursday night when I would record at home and she'd have to keep three children quiet while finishing dinner (laughs) and getting them to bed. I never thought about that aspect of it. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Thank you, Chelsea. That's not fun. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, And every single guest. Every single guest. Every single guest. Every one of of them. Uh, There might be one or two. Yeah. Let's not talk about that one. (laughs) Ryan Spencer. God damn it, Ryan. <laughs> Just kidding. Love Ryan Spencer, too. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, it's good. When I, I feel good, so I want to spread it. And yeah. the, the, you can't keep what you have unless you give it away. Yeah, spread the love. So I've heard. Spread it around. Yeah. Like butter. Okay. Butter's good. Like softened butter, not butter. Softened straight. butter. Sorry. I'm softened just butter's feeling, good. Just feeling silly. Okay. Well, that's good, man. Ride it. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So, tell me. Let's go into our guest then. We're, we're, yeah. We're, we're vibing here. Yeah, 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 Okay. Yeah. We get to the oh. guest? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me, uh, we have a, a wonderful guest today, uh, a gentleman that, that came into my life just a few short weeks ago, but he was introduced to me by the uh, um, unimpeachable and legendary Anna Wardy. So Love thank you, Anna, Anna Wardy, Wardy, for introducing me to our guest today. Um Ames chairs fan. Yeah. That's right. She's real big into the chairs. Yeah. Um, but our, our guest uh, today is a, a person in recovery. Um, and I'm going to butcher the title, uh, but he's like the community outreach director guy. <laughs> Do you want to correct me real quick? Uh, Deputy Director of Strategic Partnerships. De- Deputy sure. Director of Strategic Partnerships. That it sounds bona fide. Um, he gave me my new favorite T-shirt uh, a while back that I, I tell people about, and he's actually wearing it today, which makes me real happy. Nice. Um, but he is the uh, Deputy Director of Community Partnerships. I messed it up again, did I? But he. We're gonna at, type it down on this Ashwell uh, Clinic here in Austin, Texas, which uh, is a sort of a, an acronym for Austin Sexual Health and Wellness. So it sounds like we may be, might be talking about some spicy things today. <laughs> Serrano uh, peppers? <laughs> exactly. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marcus Sanchez. Poof. Poof. Oh! There he is. I made it. Hey, <laughs> Marcus, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. This yeah. is fun. Yeah, I. Uh, it's weird. So normally I'm really bad about getting guests, and me and Jason... You know, Jason would be like, hey, do you have a guest? And I never do. Um, and you were the first time in a while that I was like, Jason, I got a guy. Awesome. He's going to be great. He's very excited. Yes. Great. Well, that's, why he's in, that's probably why he's in such a good mood. Yeah. Uh, he's clearly, actually yeah. doing his job. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Yeah, thanks for thinking of me. I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to be here. We were just, actually just talking about you. We had a meeting at work um, right before coming here. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited about Working yeah. with you and, yeah. and, and doing this, so yeah. yeah, it's been great. So, 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 Jason, the way the way me and Marcus connected, you know, Anna Wardy introduced us, but the reason she introduced us is because she thought it would be really beneficial um, for Recovery Unplugged and Asheville to build a partnership. Sounds good. Um, because, and we'll get into more of like what they do, but they do, you know, sexual health and wellness, HIV, STD treatments, and testing, and all that kind of good stuff. So that, uh, which you know, the population we work with often has, and. You know, at Recovery Unplugged, we... Or at risk for. Yeah, or at risk yeah. for. And, and you know, we believe, you know, you know this, right? Like, uh, 
treating addiction is not just about like take the drugs away from this person. Right. right. It's, it's a good start though. Yeah. Body, mind, spirit, you know, taking care of someone's physical self, their wellness, their financial self, all these different yeah. areas of life that you got to kind of get sorted out. Um, but anyway, Marcus, let's, let's start at the beginning. You know, I know, I thought I knew you were in recovery and it turned out I was right. You are in recovery, yeah, yeah. but we have not talked about recovery much at all. We, um, yeah, we have it. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think how I want to start this. Uh, you mentioned Anna, who's our, our mutual friend. Yeah. And I was just thinking about like, uh, gosh, it's been over 10 years ago when I first met, uh, Anna. Was um, Anna your therapist in rehab? I know I was, <laughs> um, uh, invited to attend an IOP program through, uh, Travis County. So uh -huh. oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, yeah. um, an esteemed I, guest. Exactly. And, and yeah. I probably wasn't the, uh, most excited, uh, attendee at the time. Um, it, uh, I, I came into recovery, uh, on my own a few years after that, um, yeah. But that was my first time I I, I met Anna and, and started. Uh, I had an idea of like recovery in the programs. I, I grew up in a uh, alcoholic home, and so yeah. my dad went in and out of treatment. And Where'd so, you grow up? Uh, Palacios, Texas, a little bitty town on the Gulf Coast. Okay, yeah, okay. about three hours from here. Um, kind of like South, like the Valley, kind of South Texas. Um, it's it's probably the exact midpoint of the uh, arch between Galveston and Corpus. Okay, okay. close okay. to Houston. Okay. okay. We pop up during hurricane season on the map. But, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a <laughs> claim to fame. Yeah. Um, so, so let let's start there. You know, what was that like? You know, growing up in that kind of household where you know dad's in and out of treatment, alcoholic. Talk. Yeah, sure. Um, it was a little chaotic. There was, uh, it definitely wasn't just my dad. You know, that that side of the family, um, I, I witnessed a lot of uh, uh, addiction and mental health issues. Um, you know, lo lost relatives to. Uh, suicide, uh, their addiction. Um, and so it was uh, chaotic at times. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I come to learn later through recovery and treatment or, or therapy um, is that I was comfortable in that chaos. So yeah. when I started self-medicating, um, I didn't realize that it was like a result of all of that yeah. and how far I would go down, which Anna pointed out to me, and we can get to that a little later, <laughs> um, was that, uh, as she says, it can we cuss on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Fuck yeah. She said that I didn't, that I had several rock bottoms that should have stopped me, but that I had a high tolerance for my own bullshit. And that, oh, ooh. I like that. That sounds <laughs> yeah, like Yeah, and it was totally true. That kind of like was the first time that someone had put it that way to me. And yeah. I was like, oh yeah. And she's like, you, uh, you will drink and use until you die if you don't do something about it. And yeah. so like that was definitely something I knew I wasn't ready at that time. Um, but eventually I just got tired yeah. uh, of living that life and, 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 and came into the rooms on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I am an AA. I, I, I go to meetings. I work with the sponsor. I have a sponsee. Um, and that's definitely a part of, of how I'm not just able to stay sober today, but just function yeah. among people. So yeah. question, you know, you, you mentioned chaos a couple of times, right? Yes. And, and it's funny enough, I was talking to someone on my team about clients and how they're very comfortable with chaos, mm -hmm. you know? And one of the most challenging things for a lot of folks when they get into recovery is they're bored because they're so used to being in, in like a the chaos of impending doom and disaster all the time. That, that So w did you find, like when you first got sober, that that, that was part of what you needed to work on is like being okay with just like a regular yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, for sure. And I really didn't know what it was in the beginning or how to pinpoint it. Um, I think it looked like a lot of different things, you know, I mm -hmm. think um, I'm not unique. I don't think where I replace the drugs and the alcohols with, uh, with other things that, yeah. that aren't always great for me. So there was like eating and sex and, and just different stuff that I was using, but I was telling myself, but I'm not drinking or getting high. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I did have to like do some, some work around that stuff too, which is great that, you know, we have tools to use around all that yeah. stuff. Um, but I did find myself like in the beginning, like just going crazy. Like my brain was auto, I'm, I'm a night person to begin with, but yeah. like I was like craving sugar and things like at two in the morning, like I needed something and I needed to be active. Um, so, you know, I, I went to Kirby a lot <laughs> and had coffee and pie until I like got tired and went yes. and went to sleep. So it was a, one of those things of like adjusting, um, and plus like all the people that, you know, I'd partied with, they, they weren't really there to do that. So I had to like, then also like get into the fellowship of the program, which I would drag my feet on. Cause I was yeah. like, how can I relate to these people? And I yeah. still feel crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's changed over time too. Yeah. And like the, the friends that I, I, I thought I had in those relationships that I, I, I thought, 
you know, were meaningful actually look very different um, Mm -hmm. with people that share this common thread with me today. Yeah. Well, so let's rewind a little bit, you know, because I think one of the things that's really important when when folks are hearing other people's stories is like understanding how they got to the decision to actually change, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So grew up in a chaotic household. You already mentioned, you know, kind of, you know, you started using substances basically – in, in, as a response to that, maybe not, you know, maybe you weren't aware of it, but like now you know that it was kind of a response to that. And so, I mean, when did you first start to even think about like, hey, maybe maybe alcohol and drugs aren't working out so great for me? Yeah. Um, was it before or after Travis County invited you to their IOP program? You know, I think it was early on. I, I think I always <clears throat> had a sense and knew, but it was, again, something that was just like, well, this is just the way it's going to be. I, I think I remember, gosh, I was around nine, um, one of the uh, treatment centers. And uh, I also went to treatment like years later, but um, my idea of that was not good. Cause I remember, mm-hmm. you know, seeing where my dad went and, um, I remember on a family day, like sitting there and oh um, wow, so having, you would you would go to the treatment yeah, right. and like you know having the therapist sit him across from me and telling me like how you know I was a big cause of his his drinking what? and like what? yeah it was crazy like it's different than now it's like wait uh, at so, nine uh, years old this is what the therapist is yeah, telling you and it was and it was just like you just that sit is, there and listen and and he that was is like, horrible <laughs> like I'm so sad that, that yeah, happened what? to you. <laughs> It was it was a little crazy, and then I remember then like there was I have an older brother and sister. I'm I'm a lot younger, um, and then they sat down with us, and you know he then talked to the family and explained more about the disease and and that we were you know um, stressors, and then and then like by the way, probably two if not all of y'all will be alcoholics and addicts too. Um, so I had this idea in my head that that was going to be me, but I was like, no, I'm not going to let it be me. Um, I have more questions about this family session. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so you're there, your dad, your mom, your two siblings. Now, did he also tell them that they were the reason for his drinking, or was it specifically you? It was so. It was so. The whole thing around that is because I was a lot younger. Like you know, I was a surprise baby. Mm-hmm. You know, he was. Uh, you know, he was done like parenting, and then I came around and you so like derailed he, his plan. Yeah, and he was like, you know, because my mom was also trying to raise me. Like I was getting in the way of their marriage, and so he blamed a lot of like that. And I'm just kind of looking there, like at night. If I knew then what I know now, like. And, and I did, would be like, do us some inventory, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's so fucked up. Like, I can't imagine I like saying know. something like that to one of my kids. Like, obviously, yeah. You know, they, sometimes they get in the way of certain things. <laughs> For sure, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, absolutely. <laughs> but did did your mom just let that fly, or did she like come come around the bag and be like, you know what, Miko? Like, yeah, I think we were just you know kind of in shock with the whole situation and we were you know following the lead of like a licensed therapist (laughs) and like we were like no no y'all sit there and listen you know this is you know how this works and so was was that one of your introductions into professional therapy somebody telling you a nine-year-old you that everything's your fault yeah it was and so i didn't really want to come into like recovery and i especially didn't want to go into treatment because that's that was my idea of it understandable you've got like this Deep foundational memory. Exactly. And this was, you know, in the 90s. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, yeah. what was effective yeah. around that. Yeah. That um, I don't even remember, like, you know, it was probably a state funded. Not that yeah. there's, you know, anything yeah. wrong with that. Um, but and, and I'd like to point out, too, like, culturally, like, Hispanics, like, we don't do therapy. Like, Hispanic right. people are not super <laughs> therapy oriented. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. not in the 90s. Exactly. And then you've got this extra thing. Yes. Extra aversion to it. Yeah. And then I think, you know, we, I I did, uh, and it's crazy now. Like my my parents are all still back home and, and, and Palacios and all my families are, um, and you know, when I'm there, it's very hard because there's a lot of like, uh, People are sober, but it's like a lot of untreated alcoholism, and it makes yeah. me dry. Yes. Yeah. yes, and like I'd rather it's it's easy, it's easier to see it <laughs> than not see it and just feel it all over you. Yeah. Um, and there's no meeting, like there's no really recovery. There's like one meeting a week in the whole town, so you have to go like out of town to like go to meetings. But at the time when when uh, uh, he came out of treatment that time, um, I remember going to like Al-Anon with uh-huh. my mom, um, and you know sitting in the corner and kind of like while she was doing her thing and. 
Um, so I remember seeing like the big book in our home and, and like there was some talk around steps and then like until there wasn't, yeah. um, you know, he, he, he went to treatment, I guess like three times well, that I remember. Um, and so I had this negative, you know, attitude around it. Like it doesn't work, you know, it's not really, you know, something that, that is benefiting us. Um, I didn't really have a full understanding. Yeah. And then my experience with that meeting or what I saw just seemed very weird. And then my mom didn't really wasn't really receptive to it yeah. either. Like I think we went a few times and she was just like, that's, you know, crazy talk. Yeah. So we're just like, he's the problem, not me. And so there was a lot of enabling too. So it was very, uh, what I see now is a very like, you know, sick family and, and the addiction. And like, it's not just one person, it's everyone. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I learned through Anna too, is like seeing that sort of, I, I still remember like the cog with the like brackets or whatever that is, the gears yeah. and how we all kind of revolve around the addict, but like we each have our role in that and, and how it kind of like makes this entire like family unit. Well, yeah, yeah the, the family system adjusts to like, uh, I talk to people about like when you've had a car for a long time that just kind of pulls to the left. So you naturally steer a little to the right. So like, you know, the addict is the pull to the left and the family just eventually learns to balance out and adjust for that. So then when when the person, you know, when the identified patient is is trying to get sober, that means that system is now out of whack again because because they all adjusted and everybody has some work to do to try to get back to, to some healthy. I never heard that. I like that one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, like yeah, a yeah, good yeah. visual in my yeah. head. <laughs> right on. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so. So that's your introduction into therapy. And <laughs> so it's all so, it's, so excited. So it's all your recovery. fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. where do you go from there? <laughs> yeah. It's all your fault. So, so. <laughs> so yeah, it was like a lot to like, you know, process. And I think about it like, you know, I was young. I probably wasn't, you know, thinking of it. Um, I don't know. You know, I could only apply what I knew at that time to that. Um, but I do remember like then, you know, being told that I would probably be, you know, an alcoholic and an addict that, you know, I, I decided, you know, uh, that's not going to be me. Yeah. Um, and then growing up in a small town, uh, as a queer kid too, like that was a big piece yeah. of it. Like it's still not okay back home to be gay. Yeah. Um, and how, so how out were you back home? Like, were you pretty out pretty early? Was oh, it something that was a challenge to come out? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no. I didn't come out till I, I was out of the house. Like I needed to be away from that town and, yeah. and felt safe. Um, it's just a very backward sort of environment. Um, not a lot of progress being made as far as like, um, you know, uh, liberal or political views. So um, I, yeah, like I, I knew too, like I could not be out here and I still was like dealing with that. Um, you know, luckily my family has been very supportive uh, yeah. and it's what I do for a living. So I can't really hide it because I've, yeah. for the past 15 years, I've worked very closely with LGBTQ communities. Yeah. Um but yeah, it was, I think, you know, there was a lot of like, uh, uh, treating, well, a lot of use around that too. Yeah. Like uh, being kind of okay having the, the shame, like kind of trying to hide who you are. Yeah. And, and helping me feel comfortable. Just like, yeah. I was a very like shy and quiet kid. And again, like growing up in a house like that, I just tried to stay under the radar. So when yeah. it came to like having other relationships, like I discovered drinking and like, that was how I would be okay to be around people. And so I started going to all the parties and, um, you know, I started drinking pretty early, like at 14 and then more regular within like the next few years after that. Um, you know, we, we had access to it pretty easily. Yep. Um, and you know, when there's a will, there's a way. And then I remember thinking too, like, okay, well I'm drinking, but I feel so good. I feel more comfortable and it makes more sense. And I can, you know, have friends and be social. Um, and I remember telling myself then that like, cause I had told myself, I made the promise that I was never going to drink. I was not going to be like my dad. And then I would tell myself once I started drinking, like, okay, this is doable. This is the way to go, but I won't be that bad. Yeah. And I found myself for several years after that yeah. justifying, and I kept moving that bar of, like, what that bad meant. Oh, man. Um, and by then, it was like, you know, I went into drugs pretty early, too. There was there was nothing to do in a small town but, like, yeah. that stuff. So, um, And see, the way you were without – because I had a very similar experience. I was like, you know what, weed – because my dad was – is kind of an alcoholic, you know, and I never said I wouldn't drink – but I would never be like him. And then it was like, oh, well, 
weed's not really a drug. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, mushrooms also come from the earth. So they, they're okay too, <laughs> you know? And then, Facts, yes. And then that just, and eventually it was, well, I'll just, I'll do anything, just not with a needle. And that went out the window eventually too. Yeah, it was, it was hard for me because my parents were part of the whole like cocaine cowboy scene in Miami mm -hmm. in the 80s. So it was like all these really cool, successful people yep. doing stuff. And it was like, I don't want to be like my mom. Why? Yeah, you know? I definitely yeah. want to be. Like. <laughs> yeah, but so 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 you start to get into drugs. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because small so, town Texas, exactly. And so you know, it started with like it like it does. Uh, you know, with with uh, pot and shrooms and LSD and uh, you know, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. Um, and drinking was. I, I tell people, you know, I I I'm you know have other issues around other drugs. Um, but my longest and most complicated relationship has been alcohol. Like that's just always been my thing. And then I would justify it by like, oh, well, it's my genetic makeup. I was, you know, told I was going to be this. And so, uh, of course I, I, I'm this. And then, um, I graduated at 17 and moved straight to Austin, like graduated on a Friday was in Austin by Sunday. Um, just cause I couldn't wait to get out of that town. Um, and then I started like going out and exploring my sexuality. And, um, and so then the other drugs came quickly after that with yeah. like, uh, you know, cocaine and, and, and Molly, or I think it's Molly now is ecstasy back in right, the day. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But, they keep changing the name. Yeah. The <laughs> um, and then meth. And yeah. then that was the one that, you know, yeah. that, that, that took me out pretty quickly. You know, the alcohol has always had like this long slow burn and things get really bad, you know, losing jobs, relationships, yeah. Um, but they lead to each other and it all ends up bad. So how long of, of that period was, were good times? Cause you know, like me, I, I had some good years partying and I could imagine how liberating that was for you mm -hmm. to move out of the small town, being able to be yourself finally and having all these euphoric drugs around and yeah. just being able to be yourself in this community. How long did, did the, the good part of the high last for? Yeah. There must've been a time where you were like living your best life. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> because it was such a blur like like there were good times like you know i'm not gonna lie and say like oh it was horrible because like i that was how i was like being okay with myself um you know my 20s when i look back were pretty much a nightmare but like i was having or what i thought i was having was really uh really uh fun times the older i got it just wasn't fun anymore like yeah. by the time i was 30 it was like yeah why am i still doing this and i have yeah. nothing to show for it um but there was a period of like me um, having fun. And I think part of that too is like, uh, you know, coming to terms and, 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 and I think about it and the work that I do today, like if you look at Texas and not having really um, sufficient, I think, uh, sexual health education, you know, at a young age, but the opposite, especially if you're gay and being told that this is wrong or bad or whatever, and even more extreme depending on your family or environment, um, and so that was a big part of it too. It's like I had internalized stuff, so I had to be higher drunk to even have sex. And yeah. so that's something that I still work in in therapy today is like how do I have sober, healthy sex if that's mm -hmm. the way that I was um, able to do it because I had all this like negative thoughts behind that ingrained in me based on my environment. So And so that 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 brings us to a good point. You know, the other day when I was visiting your office, someone used the term chem sex. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a term that I've heard before, but I've never really, you know, like I kind of know what it means, right? It means you you, you smoke meth and you and you you have sex. Yeah. But <laughs> what's the deal with that? Like why? <laughs> <laughs> like um, we don't talk about like booze sex, you know, or like weed sex, you know. But chem sex is very specifically <laughs> about methamphetamines, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know something happens different um, to the brain, and I'm not. A scientist or a doctor so i'm not going to go into like the parts of the brain that lights up but but you're gay and you've done meth so yes. you're more of an expert <laughs> on this than me or jason um, yeah <laughs> i know it heightens your 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 sexual appetite your your inhibitions are lowered um i think more so than like with alcohol like you for me i will talk personally like you do things i probably normally wouldn't do yeah. um um and and then and in that it's just a lot of um just this huge increase of like sexual desire to um you know i could be in it and day for days at a time it's like being um, like a 13 year old all over again yeah yeah and putting yourself in places you like again probably wouldn't be in situations mm -hmm. that, that you wouldn't uh be in um and we see a lot of that with the populations we work with at, at work too and yeah. so um and i see it starting off as like you know like it's partying like a party drug and it's a way to like 
have fun and crazy sex. Uh, but then the issue is that it's so addictive and then the sex begins to um, get tangled up with, with the drugs. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, so, it, and the subculture around that, the whole like uh, party and play mm-hmm. kind of thing is somewhat not accepted, but it, it's a regular part of, of, you know, the community. And yeah. cause I, I have a lot of sponsee brothers who, who are gay men mm-hmm who had to do a lot of work around getting clean and then not going to the bathhouse, not doing things like that. And where it's just so intertwined in yeah. who they think they are and how they, you know, how they could be intimate with somebody else and to, to how to, so how do you, when they're, when you're dealing with somebody who kind of enjoys the risk part of it, how mm-hmm. do you reach that person? Um, that's a good question. And I think it's, it's going back to like the work and finding these, you know, healthy boundaries. Uh, what, what do they tell us are, are sane and sound sex ideals. Yeah. And um, uh, for me, it's had, it, it, it has to start with like untangling the sex and the drugs. Um, and, and then that, that has come up with like, you know, work and therapy too. It's not just, you know, my recovery program, it's both and together at the same time. Um, but reaching those communities, I think it's, it's like, <sighs> We do a lot of like harm reduction and meeting people where they are. Mm-hmm. But what I've seen is once we work with those populations, especially um, gay men and meth, um, it doesn't take long before they're at a place where like, okay, this is clearly a problem. I need to stop. And so then we're able to refer them to to um, recovery resources. Um, and I think it's just also like getting them back to a place of where they're able to like, you know, they may not have even gotten to that place of where they're okay sexually. I think in gay yeah. culture – um, it's, it's very much like how you look and how you're attractive to the other guys. And when you're on meth, like you feel fearless and sexy and, and, you know, everyone's yeah, the, the, everyone, there's no like, the oh, self-consciousness yeah. goes away. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And so that's a big part of it too, is how you see yourself. Yeah. So a lot of it is like that teaching self-love and, and going back to like the deeper roots of like, uh, being okay with sexuality. Yeah. I think for us too, like in the line of white, I work, we do. Um, and, and, uh, Joseph, I've talked to you about this is like how we're a little different is that we've sort of become more in line with like the kink community. Cause we saw a need within the LGBTQ spaces where they didn't really feel totally accepted. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of like recovery and sober spaces in that it's more about like the community and, and the act. And it's actually a very, um, cool thing to see and be around because there is a lot of like consent and respect. And so yeah. um, a lot of that is uh, in sober spaces because of that fine line of, of mixing like drugs that could put you in an altered state where you're not really fully aware of your consent mm-hmm. and like the actual practice of being in yeah. that headspace of, well, you know, the kink community. Well, there's, there's a phenomenon that, that I see a lot here in Texas and I don't know if it's the same in other States, but the recovery slash treatment community kind of has this expectation of like, okay, you've put down the drugs. Now you need to be like a super shiny, squeaky clean, like uh, boy scout Puritan expectation of how you should be in your behavior. <laughs> no, right? I, no, it's true. And right? I think, you know, you guys and, you know, Ashwell and recovery unplugged. I think we, we probably both feel a little space, feel a little bit of a space of like, we're going to get you sober and there's going to be some rough spots still, but we're going to love you anyway with the rough spot, you know, or you guys, you know, not getting them sober, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like we're going to accept you with, with what people may perceive as the warts, right. And mm-hmm. all, and, and whatever your kink may be or whatever other stuff you're still struggling with. That's okay. Yeah, And, and, and I also think at least when it comes to, Recovery Unplugged and what we do, I think not being like 12 step based probably helps a lot in that. Because yeah. I know a lot of people who have gone to, you know, and I'm a 12 step guy too, as yeah. you know, we all are that we've talked about yeah. on here and it works for me personally. But had I gone to a treatment center that that's what they were kind of pushing, like, yeah. I don't know if I would have taken to it as well. You know, like yeah. I get that option to do it if I want and to do my own personal recovery as I see fit outside of the treatment center. Yeah. So I think that, that, that plays a lot into yeah. at least our end of it. Yeah. And then with yeah. you guys, it's like, you know, your sexuality is your sexuality and how you want to do that. And, yeah. Right? Yeah. I think, and it's creating those affirming spaces. Cause again, like this is something that a lot of people weren't like 
exposed to or celebrated. I think it's different now. Like I look at the representation, like representation matters, like of, yeah. uh, LGBTQ people on and media. Right. Um, there was not a lot of that when I was growing up in yeah. like the eighties and the nineties and it looks different now. And I think that's a big part of it. And, um, um, and for us, like, you know, creating a medical home that's affirming for LGBTQ people, that's not an experience that a lot of people have had and yeah. they don't feel comfortable talking about their sex. Um, we've been told, you know, the horror stories of them like opening up about that because we prescribe, you know, um, prep to prevent HIV where, uh, early patients, when we first started this work, um, I guess like back in 2015, when prep was more accessible in Austin, um, a lot of people were telling us they had that, tried to have that conversation with their doctor. And now they don't feel safe going back because they felt like stigma and shame and they're like, oh, they don't really accept me. Yeah, and and right. that's like a lot of people's experience with like medical institutions. And yeah. we also work with uh, uh, <clears throat> trans patients uh, with gender affirming care uh, and their hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And so that's another place where it's like they've never had a good experience with medical professionals based on the stigma. Yeah. So, so talking about stigma and I'll go back further to I mean, I don't even think stigma is a fair word for it. I think like demonizing it mm -hmm. in the 80s. Bigotry. Yeah, I mean, do you remember the what was the case? The Ray brothers from Florida. They were three brothers who were hemophiliac who had blood transfusion, and and contracted HIV or AIDS. I think it was AIDS at the time, mm -hmm. and they lived in a smaller community in Florida. And like the the community burned their house down when they weren't home yeah. and just told them to get out that they weren't welcome here. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, coming from you know, we were pro probably in the same age bracket, you know, growing up in the 80s to where it was just, this is a gay disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people were like, good, you know, like, yeah. honestly, yeah. like a lot of people looked at it that way. And then to yeah, where there's, there's that one f famous picture where the guys holding up a sign that says like, God hates fags or something. like Yeah, that. yeah. And that was like, fine to most people. Right. Yeah. Right. So to see where that was, then to where we are now, to where there's more open discussion about it, right? What do you see? What would you like to see? How would you like that this to continue? Because I know what it's starting there's looking like. It's to starting yeah. to move a little bit backwards at this point, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. So yeah, and I I do want to touch on that. But to answer your question, um, I think it's more partnerships and like accessibility. Like we know and we've seen like uh, creating. Um, institutions like a medical institution for specifically for people with culturally aware care um is is saving lives like you know these are folks that are also within marginalized communities that are most acceptable to um hiv so you, we think about like people of color and women of color yeah. like there's not really a, a safe and accepting space all the time for them mm -hmm. um so we try to create that that space that gives people a different experience and then they start to like change their views on that and then become more empowered to like take ownership of, of their own wellness. Um, and then the partnerships like, you know, uh, working with uh, Recovery Unplugged, like to help us get access and, and, and people to, to know about our services. Yeah, because we talk about stigma a lot, right? But we typically talk about like stigma around addiction. Mm -hmm. right. But then you got to realize there's folks who are stacking onto that, you know, the stigma around their sexuality, stigma around their gender, stigma around their, uh, their uh, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, if you think it's hard to walk into a room and say, like, you know, hey, I'm a drug addict and, and be ready to accept that label, like, stack that three, four times. Yeah. And, and it just, yeah. I think that highlights how important it is to have a space like what you guys do. Yeah. Well, and it exists in our spaces, too. I mean, you know, our LGBTQ spaces are not always affirming for other groups. Like, if you think about, like, trans communities. Yeah. So making sure that we have those values and that we're very clear on, like, who the space is for. And if yeah. you can't be down with that, then you're probably not. Yeah. A good fit for I've us. actually met some some very open out progressive gay individuals who are like I don't get down with the trans thing yeah you know yeah. that they I think they're just so confused or don't understand it, it it's crazy and then we we see it with um like substance use and, and people who use drugs you know I've worked in other uh clinics who are not as accepting of those communities and so Asheville I think we're different whereas like we we um that's part of the communities that we serve like if yeah. you look at LGBTQ po folks um, there's higher rates of substance use and, and suicide. And a yeah. lot of it is that like self-medicating of like to be okay with who you are, just dealing with like society telling you that you're not, you know, welcome or safe yeah. here. Um, and I'm thinking too, like, yes, we have a lot of, like, we've done a lot of work, but like 
when you look at progress, I, I do feel like we're taking some step, steps back. Yeah. You know, after the Colorado Spring shootings, like now these Proud Boys are showing up to drag events. You know, yeah. where people are going with guns this weekend. Yeah, yeah. And, and, like, and the police didn't show up to do anything. Yeah, yeah. And there's like shows here that are being canceled, like drag events, just because I was like, well, it's not safe anymore because now people are just showing up with rifles and, and standing yeah. outside, and it's like, uh, how did we get there from a place that should have been? Hey, let's be compassionate about people who were killed. It, it, it like took yeah. like the opposite turn where people use this to like motivate more of that activity, yeah. which, um, you know, obviously that's not us and what we do. Um, but I wanted to touch on that to, to, to highlight that, you know, well, just how there was, I mean, since we, we try not to get super, super political, but might as well. There was a, <laughs> there was an interview that they did a couple weeks ago with the father of the, uh, I don't know if we're still calling him alleged shooter, but with the guy that did it. And, you know, they were talking to him. He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, I heard that, that, you know, there was a shooting at this nightclub and it was, then I found out it was a gay club. And then I was like, oh my God, is my son gay? And they were like, no, he's not gay. He was like, oh, okay. Like so relieved that his son who had just murdered, I don't know, five, six people. Like five. Yeah. It was about five people, but still so relieved that his son was not gay was like I, shocking to me. I never, I, I wasn't even aware of that. So don't watch the news, man. The news, yeah. the news sucks. And not all of them were gay. Like there were two allies that were yeah. killed and, and uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it, it sucks that that happens. And I feel like, you know, people um, have become empowered around that kind of stuff too. Yep. And, and that's kind of scary, but um yeah, and that's why, you know, I believe that representation and safe spaces are so important because we mm -hmm. need to start teaching a younger generation that it's okay to be who you are because um, it does have an effect. You know, it and could to let to drugs people and be alcohol. who they are. Exactly. It's like none of your, it's none of your fucking business. Yeah, you right. Know? So do you deal with, with, with situations like that where people call what you do like an agenda? I have. Um, I've done this work for, I guess, like 15 years now. Um, so since before you got sober? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, um, I've been in situations, <clears throat> I used to manage a, a drop-in center for queer, uh, young people, um, you know, getting some letters from religious groups, you know, telling us we we're going to hell. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing, but then what scares me is like, if they're sending letters and they know where we are, I don't know, or want to see what's next. Yeah. Um, and then to the, you know, up in 2015, opening some of our first, uh, sexual health clinics, uh, that do the work that we do today. Um, and having um, um, become a target for folks and getting yeah. phone calls and, and and letters and, you know, having to think through security and like, you know, is it safe for us to even be here? Mm -hmm. um, and just having to be, you know, on uh, guard around that stuff. Um, so, yeah, it still exists. And I think we look at Austin as a, you know, progressive city. I think we're liberal still in Texas. Bubble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not super progressive, I think. Uh, the way we want to think it is. Um, and there are Austin still more, people here. Austin that, is, is folks who want to appear progressive more so yeah. than actually progressive. I would agree with that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. We, we went down a little rabbit hole, which is super fascinating, but like, let's get you sober, right? So yeah. you start getting DUIs <laughs> and stuff and you're like, yeah. maybe this isn't so much fun anymore. Um, but the DUIs were not enough. Or I'm assuming it was a DUI. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're not enough to make you say like, you know what? I should stop <laughs> drinking and doing drugs. So, let. When was it that you accepted that you're like, you know, I need to stop. I'm ready to stop. I want to stop. Like, what were the, what circumstances were you in at that yeah, time? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I was just older and tired. I think one day, um, you know, I have to look back and and think of like about how much I lost and like, you know. God love Anna. She was still in the back of my head after all these years. You know, I, I should have listened back then. And I would run into her meetings after, like we became close, like yeah. going to meetings and stuff. And she would, you know, connect me with other people that she would meet that thought, you know, it'd be good to hear your story. And um, so we've stayed in touch this whole time, but it was, it was a lot of what she said. It's like, I will let this kill me. Like, you know, I remember uh, when she told me that we were in this like group and everyone was talking about like the rock bottom and I had nothing to say. And yeah. so she called me after her. She's like, why didn't you share? And I was like, because like everything everyone shared, I had experienced yeah. and it wasn't like, that's not a bottom to me. And she's like, well, you had several rock bottoms. Um, yeah. You're just going to let this kill you. Yeah. And so uh, it was that it was like, you know, I, um, 
had started to do more work in therapy and then doing the work that I do become more um, plugged into communities and like empowering people. And it's like, if I can do this for other people, why can't I do that for myself? Like I clearly didn't love myself or think I deserve better. Mm -hmm. um, and I just got tired. And so I guess about, it's been okay, well over 10 years now since I walked into the rooms uh, on my own for myself. Yeah. Um, and it was like no tragic thing that, put me there because there were a lot of tragic things that yeah. should have put me in that right. seat. Um, it was just knowing that like, yeah, I will let this kill me. Like, and I got tired of like losing just stuff. Like I, I was one of those um, folks that like lose jobs, relationships, car, like, like I, I was not managing or winning at all. No. <laughs> like there was never a period where like I, I got this under control. It was yeah. always like whatever was... I put in my body, I will use it till yeah. I burn everything down. Um, were, were you, were back. you big at all on trying to keep up appearances that you had sh your shit together? I think so. Yeah. Um, but clear, it was obvious to yeah. everyone around me that like, yeah, you don't, pe normal people don't live yeah. like this. The, the, the word that <laughs> but, keeps coming to mind is hot mess. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It was definitely that for a while. Um, yeah. And it just, you know, after, after you get older, like it just doesn't look good anymore. It doesn't yeah. feel good. Um, and I remember going into the meetings and, and it was like night and day from when I was like, you know, had to go get my little dance card signed yeah. <laughs> to where like I was going on my own. Um, and yeah, then choosing my, to be there instead of being told yeah, to be there. Yeah, and then my sponsor, like, you know, he's like, that's called willingness. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> that That is the difference. And so I talk a lot about that with the people I work with is a willingness. And like, you know, it's not always there because even in the beginning, I didn't really um, get it. And I've had a few sponsors uh, since then. And um and in the beginning, I just didn't want to do the work, and it took me a long time. And uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was like the the God thing. I go to the um, uh, LGBTQ clubhouse, um, the Colorado Club. Yeah, yeah, I go, yeah, I go to the gay meetings and uh, the a gay AA. Um, and a lot of people that I talk to talk about like the the God topic keeps mm -hmm. coming up, and how much because of their experience being gay, like growing up in a religious family, d could not see a way to connect with the program. Um, I didn't have that experience. I, I grew up in a church. Um, uh, I grew up Presbyterian, but I, I was okay with that concept of a higher power for me. And I thought that was what it was going to work. And I tried to keep making that fit and it just wasn't mm -hmm. working. Um, and I thought, you know, one, two, and three, I have down, like, I'm good. I'm ready for four. And they're like, no. And I got stuck for like three months, just trying to figure that out. That four step will get you. Yeah, yeah, and then that yeah. one too. That yeah. So it took me a while, um, but once I started, like you know, doing those the steps with different people and um, walking people through the steps as well, like it just, I don't know. It it it's gotten. Um, I don't want to say easier, but it's gotten a, a different. I think I have different experiences and different points of views every time. Um, and now we're talking about step work earlier. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm dealing with something right now. I called my sponsor yesterday and like, and I'm always like, he's going to make me write something. Cause I always have to write <laughs> All the time with yeah. the writing. So, so we do a lot of inventory, just like regular, you know, inventory. And he has me not doing full inventory, but I have to make a list a little spot today. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, but it's like, you know, how great that I get to do that and not be locked up right now yeah. where yeah. I would have been had I not yeah. gotten tired. Exactly. I mean, the option is like, do I call my sponsor and do some writing? Or do I, you know, mess up things in my life that are going to take much longer to yeah. repair? <laughs> well, I mean, part of why I'm in such a good mood and, you know, how I'm talking about how I'm getting back into my step work. And it's just the fact that I'm giving myself the opportunity to get the fuck out of my own way on little shit that would just trip me up, you know, like little bullshit, like traffic and stuff like that, that would just send me over the edge. And when I when I give myself the opportunity to say, like, okay, I'm going to think about why I'm feeling like this and then try to find a way out of, like, I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to get mad every time I step in the car. I don't want to get mad when I go to the grocery store. So let me do something about it. And it's the willingness of just wanting to not feel that way anymore that yeah. that opens, that gives you the opportunity to do so, in yeah. my opinion. So did y'all ever uh, get the, have somebody tell you about the willingness prayer? I don't know. The, the willingness prayer was a big thing in Kerrville back in the day was, you know, God, please help me want to want to want to do this. <laughs> no, but that makes a lot of sense because I remember when I when I was in my active addiction, a big part of it was like, you know, I'd, I'd steal from my mom and, you know, after I already hemorrhaged her for all of her money and just be like, 
I want to feel bad for what I'm doing, but I don't, Yeah, you know, like I should really feel like a piece of shit right now, but I don't like, how do I get these feelings back? So that, that was a big part of yeah. what, what, what brought me into, you know, wanting to get my shit together. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so what's, uh, what's your life look like today? Yeah. Um, you know, I still struggle, but uh, like I said, you know, I have a better way to live. Um, you know, I still have bad days. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I work a lot and I have three dogs and a partner and, you know, life keeps me busy. But what I've learned is that like when I just don't feel right or feel twisted up, like that's me, um, playing God or sitting in self-will. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my, my sponsor today tells me, you know, we have a, uh, a fatal and progressive disease. So we have to take our daily medication. Um, and the longer we go without taking that medication, the sicker we get. And so I, that's a reminder too, cause I'm feeling off. Like it's yeah. like, I probably haven't been to a meeting or I need to get to a meeting. So, um, it's definitely using the tools and, 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 you know, listening to that internal, like twisted upness <laughs> when I'm getting sick. Um, but giving myself grace because there's a miracle in just like knowing my character defects. Like I, I would joke like you know, the biggest thing this program gave gave me was my character defects because I had no clue. Like I was <laughs> running for years, making everyone miserable and being the victim. And then today, it's like I can see when that stuff is coming yeah. up, and it's like at least I see it because yeah. there was like years where like I didn't, and I was making everyone and myself miserable. So like that's a gift. So I try to give myself grace. Yeah, there's something um, really beautiful about like when you stop playing the victim, yeah. Because then you're able to like take some ownership of your life, and and I know for me and my addiction, it was a lot of waiting around for life to happen to me, right? You know what I mean? It's like, well, what's going to happen? Who knows? Let's see. And but now it's much more like I have a calendar and I know what to expect, <laughs> and I see, you know. So uh, w when I was doing my my first six step, because I work NA, so what we do, you know. So Our step work is going to take like took, a year. It took him six years to get to the six step. It's, no, <laughs> but no, seriously, it, it takes at least a year to go through the steps, you know? So I'm working on my six step and, and my girlfriend, I was like, you know, I'm going through some character defects right now. It would really help me if you would tell, you know, if you would help mm. me out with them. What, what do you think some of them are? And she's like, well, you get way too defensive. Much. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I get too <laughs> defensive. You are you know, and it's, yeah. I love to be able to work on that stuff. Question, yeah. is your partner also in recovery? He is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is, you know, it's a blessing and a challenge <laughs> at the same time. Um, cause I've tried to be with Normie, like what I learned too, it's like, you know, I've seen, and I, we have friends that are addicts together and then yeah. other friends who are couples that are not and, um, uh, are in recovery together. And, um, yeah, you know, I think, um, part of my defects of character somewhere, there's a column dedicated to it out there, but it's the, like being in relationships with someone who is not and how I like burn that down because that's too normal for me yeah. because of the growing up in chaos. <laughs> yeah. You want the chaos. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I turn into like a, you know, a crazy, you know, asshole. So, um, you know, it's work. And like when we're both doing the work, things are good, but like you can tell when someone's like kind of off and, um, you know, that's a blessing of the program too. Cause it's like, I stay in my lane because I'm powerless over you and your disease. I, I need to show up for myself. Um, and usually, you know, we both kind of line up, um, <clears throat> without having that conversation of like, let me do your inventory. Yeah. You, probably need to get to me. <laughs> you need to call your sponsor. Yeah. yeah that's a good, <laughs> yes. That's a, um, but yeah, it's, it's good. And, and work keeps me busy. I love, you know, what I do and, and the people that we're serving, like, I'm excited about our hep C program because it's, it's, uh, a community that like I care about. And that's the other thing in like sexual health. I've been doing it for so long and like it's, it has not always felt inclusive of mm -hmm. people who use drugs or in recovery. Yeah. Um, so being able to use my lived experience to like bring that into the work that I do um, and support a program that is doing that has been really um, rewarding. Yeah. There's, you know, so many people who need that. Can you tell us about the Hep C program? Yeah, sure. So we uh, we started, I guess, earlier this year. Um, uh, we can treat Hep C now. Um, but what we do is sort of like what we heard with PrEP in the beginning where um, doctors weren't prescribing, but we were hearing from from uh, people newly in recovery or, or uh, uh, actively using is that their doctors weren't prescribing treatment for hep C um, because it's one, expensive, and two, it's an 11-week cycle. 
So they didn't think that they um, were in a place where they could finish the cycle. And mm, then okay. it, it's hard to get back on once you start uh, or stop. And so, um, you know, what we've done is what we did with prep. We combat that and show them the opposite. So we actually um, help people get insurance if they don't have insurance uh, and get the medication covered. Um, and then we start them on the treatment cycle uh, or 12 weeks. I'm sorry. And then we have a team that stays with them the entire time. And we've had uh, a 98% success rate. I think there were two folks who, who went back to prison. A lot of that population for us is yeah, right. recently incarcerated, um, are coming back or back into um, uh, prison. Um, so we proved the opposite of what doctors were telling these people is that they can finish that treatment. We just kind of check in with them. We A lot of it is like, you know, uh, we have folks that have been – you know, away for a long time. And when they come back, you know, we have like everyone is on telehealth and, you know, portals to access all your records. And so people are not up to date on technology. Yeah. And so we'll get people set up on an email. We show them how to do their portals and get their lab results. We'll go with them to their appointments if we have to, because um, it's that distrust too, that, that keeps people from, from seeking help. Um, and we've seen people completely shift. Like they get through the, that that cycle, and they now have insurance to take care of all the other you know medical needs, and they just have this completely uh, shift with empowerment of like, okay, what's next? Yeah. I, I didn't think I was ever going to cure this. I thought I was going to die from this, but now that I'm cured, let me. I fixed go one do all thing. The other what things. else yeah. can I yeah. fix? Right? Because I mean, I, I did the Hep C treatment, and and to have a support would have been big for me because it gets it's a little rough going through going yeah. through that uh that 11 weeks but you know I, i'm so glad that i that i took care of that when i did yeah yeah that's awesome. yeah yeah and we're happy to to provide that and you know in addition to all of our other services I, i'm just like really excited about this program specifically because i think for me it's the first time in a long time doing this line of work where i've seen an actual like deeper connection and understanding mm -hmm. with for people in recovery and people who use drugs um, which is a lot of our population. Yeah, just you know? bridging that gap between yeah. those. That's amazing. So we are getting towards the end of our time. And I feel like, man, I feel like we could talk a bunch more about like this kind of stuff if we had more time, but <laughs> we don't. So one of the things we like to do is we kind of get ready to wrap up the show is something called rapid fire question time. So it's rapid fire question time. <laughs> it's rapid fire question time. Um, so we're going to ask you five questions rapidly, if, if you didn't figure that out already. And your job is to try to answer them as rapidly as possible. All right. I, um, think I can get my brain there. Okay. All right. So first one <laughs> is my favorite one. Ben and Jerry's come to you and they say, hey, we want to do a Marcus Sanchez uh, you know, flavor of, of ice cream. What goes in that ice cream and what do you call it? Hot mess. Um, <laughs> uh, probably chili peppers and chocolate. Um Throw some coconut. Yeah. I will buy that. Yeah. That, yes. that sounds good. I also just got back from Santa Fe, so there was like chili powder and everything. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hatch chilies yeah. everywhere. I love it. I love it. Okay, so time travel is now possible, and they're offering time travel vacations. You can go to any time and place in history. Where do you go? Oh, my goodness. Um, wow. Um that's a good question. I've always loved uh, the Renaissance. So I think I would love to go back and see. I'm also an artist, so going back and experience like the architecture and the art in that time. Um, yeah, not specific. Probably Italy. During okay. The Renaissance time. Yeah. Nice. So uh, you've had a rough day, you know, and all you want to do is go home and binge watch some Netflix. What show are you binge watching? Oh man, it changes. Um, I just finished Wednesday and I'm not watching anything. Oh, we're watching Wednesday right now too. Yeah, it's so good. good. But um, I love to revisit like Schitt's Creek. I think I'd probably watch that again. That's a good comfort food show for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh man, what was what I was just going to ask? I just had it. Go one more and then. Oh. I'll... Oh. Okay. Um, who's your favorite Ninja Turtle and why? Ninja Turtle. Um, I was always drawn to Donatello just because I think the purple. Yeah, yeah I like the purple. stick. I like a big stick. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking it. You said it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Irrational fear. What is your most irrational fear? Either childhood or current, or maybe one that's overlapped. Yeah, I think I still struggle with like this fear of what everyone is saying and thinking about me. 
That, that, Even though it's probably nothing, <laughs> but it's always there. Yeah. No, because that's right when you come to me, it's like, no, they're all thinking about themselves. Yeah, nobody's, right. thinking like, nobody's thinking about, thinking about you. <laughs> well, I'm here. Uh, get, I'm here worried about being possessed by the devil. Oh, so still, that, take that's my. I still. It's. A, I know it's irrational, but if it happens, I'll. Uh, I just see Killer Bees was a big thing. Like when Killer Bees? Oh, that's man, in the 90s? Like, the 90s well, they, yeah, isn't like, that uh, how Macaulay Culkin died in that one movie? I think that was just I one bee, just wasn't bees, it? Yeah. 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 There weren't even bee? the killer ones. I never so was allergic. Yeah. yeah. My girl was He can't too. see without his glasses. <laughs> 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 um, well, last thing we'd like to do is just give you a moment to kind of have the floor, you know, whatever you want to share, if you want to plug Ashwell, uh, yeah. and it, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I mean, I think we covered everything. If I'm going to uh, plug Ashwell, I would say, you know, you can visit ashwellatx.org um, and get a, a better idea of our um, all of our services, learn more about hep C, uh, HIV testing and treatment, uh, PrEP and PEP for, for HIV prevention. Um, yeah, and other than that, um, I'm, I'm around Austin a lot, so um, uh, say hi if you see me. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm excited that you know, Ashwell and Recovery Unplugged are going to work on some big stuff. That, that's exciting news. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, you know, come back soon and, and we could uh, talk a little bit more. Yeah. This is fun. Thank you. So, uh, thank you to all our loyal listeners. You know, I'm reminding you today to like, follow, share, subscribe. And check uh, out the website. Check out the website whenever that gets launched. Leave some reviews. Pod. Dot com something like that we'll yeah. let you know on the website when we figure it out um, but thank you uh, tell your friends and as we like to say here on toxicology there's a, there's thousand, a thousand ways, ways in, in and, a and a thousand, thousand ways, ways out. out and we, we hope, hope you find, find yours, yours.